Let's consult the record of God's dear Son. Let's go to John chapter 18 this morning. John 18. For weeks I've been struggling with what to share on Good Friday. And uh, it seems to me that you have two choices here. You can focus on the epistles and you can focus on the significance of what Jesus did, what it meant, or you can zero in on the human drama. You can go to the Gospels and watch him perform his redemptive work for the world. I thought I would just zero in on the Gospels. Not really taking our eyes off the significance, of course, of what Jesus did, but we We want to go to the Gospel of John because John was there. You can't get closer to the cross than John. He was standing right there. And he said, I'm writing what I'm writing here for you people so that you can believe in the Son of God. And in believing, you can be saved. You can be forgiven. Your estrangement with God can be over with. You can be reconciled to a holy God. You can be restored. You can have a home in heaven. All those wonderful things. In John chapter 18, as the scene opens, the Lord Jesus has suffered the indignity of betrayal and abandonment, arrest and ill treatment, and many, many false accusations against him. The chief priests and the elders of the people, they have brought Jesus now bound before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, the procurator, the prefect, rather, of Judea, who really didn't want to try this case, did he? In fact, in John 18 and verse 31, Pilate, we're told, insisted to those Jewish religious leaders that they take Jesus. You take him, he said, and judge him according to your law. I don't want any part of this. What's their response? It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Oh, really? According to whose law, God's or man's? According to Leviticus 24, 16, those who were guilty of blasphemy were to die through stoning. These men knew this very well. On two occasions, they attempted to stone Jesus to death. John chapter 8, John chapter 10. They knew Leviticus very well. In fact, the Lord Jesus just sort of effortlessly overrode their evil desires and just slipped right through their fingers. It wasn't his time to die. And that's a gentle reminder, I think, of God's unchallenged and unmatched sovereignty over the created order. Nothing happens here by way of historic eventuation unless God gives permission. And they were not going to lay a finger on Jesus until the time was right. But they tried it. They knew that if you're a blasphemer, you die by stoning. They tried it. But here, in front of Pontius Pilate, they confess that Roman law actually supersedes the law of God. How about that? Friends, that's a common diagnostic feature of heretics and false brethren. Just see how they regard human government, what place they give it. Who really is in authority around here? Is it man-made government or is it God in heaven? That's that's something to watch out for. We got to see a little bit of that in the last few years, didn't we? We Got to see who is who around here. Oh, these men are very unlike Daniel in the Old Testament and his his three friends. Those men respectfully but definitely refused to compromise on the known will of God as expressed in his law. They weren't going to do it even on pain of death. No way. But here, these wicked men, they recognize and confess Rome as the supreme authority. Godless, wicked, compromising, self-seeking. The Bible says Pilate knew that it was for envy that they brought Jesus before him. And the prophecy of Jacob, uttered in Genesis 49 and verse 10, had come to pass at long last. Shiloh had come. The one to whom it belongs has come. Messiah has come. And the scepter has departed out of Judah. These people no longer have a kingdom. They've surrendered it over to Rome. And verse 32 says that this is all according to the plan, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Remember what Jesus said in John 3, 14? 
He says, as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, as Moses lifted up that, that serpent, I must be lifted up too. And remember what Jesus said in John 12, 32, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And there the Lord Jesus is predicting, prophesying his death by crucifixion. Crucifixion, that's a Roman mode of killing people. They nail you to a tree, let you hang there until you, until you just choke to death and you're gone. That's the Romans' way of doing it. Why did he have to die that way? Because Deuteronomy 21, 23 declared, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus Christ looked to the world to be literally accursed of God as he hung there between heaven and earth. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Our sin, the world's sin, your personal sin, my personal sin, has brought a curse upon all of us. But the Bible says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, Galatians 3.13. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What an exchange. We're guilty. We're filthy. We're wicked. We drink iniquity like water. We're ripe for judgment. But the sinless, spotless Son of God has come into the world And he takes our place. What an exchange. He doesn't just take your guilt away from you. He actually imputes to you his own righteousness. You're not just innocent, but you're righteous when you trust in Jesus for salvation. You believe that the record of God's dear son is true, essential but insufficient. You also have to trust in him, active trust in the Savior, and he'll change everything for you. He changed it. He changed everything for me. And the Bible says that he who has been forgiven much loves much. And if you think about it, we've all been forgiven very much. We ought to love him very much. And all this was done according to the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, the Bible says. Nothing took our God by surprise at the dawn of human history. This was all prophesied. God said the seed of the woman was going to crush that serpent, the devil and Satan, the accuser and the tempter. Right there at the dawn of human history, the plan was already in place. At the right time, Messiah would come into the world and destroy the forces of darkness. And he did it at the cross. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ took flesh and blood that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And therefore he could release all of us who all our lifetimes were terrified of dying and being judged. The redemptive work of Jesus takes care of that problem. Death is no longer scary. In fact, death now is just a thin vestibule to a beautiful place that Jesus has prepared for those who love and trust him. All accomplished by Jesus Christ and his redemptive work that we're contemplating here today. Look at John 19 now, please. Verse 1, 19, 1. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers uh, twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. The scourging of Jesus fulfills the prophecy of Psalm 129 and verse 3. And there the writer says, The plowers have plowed upon my back, and they made long their furrows. And that was literally true of Jesus. They opened his back wide with a Roman flagrum. You know why his back was opened up like that? He was receiving the, the punishment we deserved because we turned our back on God. I turned my back on God for 20 long years. Didn't want to know him, didn't want to hear from him. I turned my back to him. But Jesus did not turn his back on his father, but he offered his back to the smiters who opened his back wide with a flagrum. He was crowned with thorns and a purple robe was put on him. The Greek indicates that the robe was a deep blue red 
Matthew calls the robe scarlet, a scarlet robe and a crown of thorns. The scarlet and the thorns, of course, are emblems of sin. Genesis 3.18, God says, I'm cursing this world for your sake, guilty Adam. Thorns and thistles are going to come up now. A reminder of your transgressions against me. In fact, God said, I'm cursing the earth, and it'll be hard to survive, Adam. And he said, I'm doing it for your sake. You'll be so busy surviving, you and your descendants, you just can't be as evil as you otherwise would be. The thorns. Powerful reminder. And the scarlet. Isaiah 118 says, our sins are like scarlet. Impossible for man to rub out, erase, but not too hard for God. God says, though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be white as snow, as white as wool. But Jesus, there he stands, the crown, the scarlet, signifying the truth expressed in Isaiah 53 and verse 6, that God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And you notice the change of garments The Bible says they stripped Jesus of his garment. They put that robe on him, mocked him, and then they took it off of him and put his own raiment back on him. The change of garments reminds us of the Old Testament high priesthood. On the holiest day of the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, on that holiest of days, the high priest would have to change his garments as he performed his redemptive work for Israel. The atoning work that he had to perform involved the garment change. That was part of the sacred duties at that time. And the Yom Kippur ritual involved two animals, two goats. One goat was sent off into the wilderness, a symbol of sin being carried away. Get out of here. Come off your people and and go away. And the other goat was killed, a symbol of atonement, Blood sacrifice, a high redemptive price, innocent blood being shed. Both are symbolic of Christ's redemptive work. John identified Jesus as the Lamb who bears away the sin of the world. And the Apostle John says that our Lord Jesus is the propitiation, that's the atoning sacrifice, not for our sins, says John, but for the sins of the whole world. I absolutely affirm that Jesus Christ died for every last man, woman, and child on this planet. He is the Savior of all men, says Paul, especially those who believe. He has provided salvation for everyone, but not everyone is saved because that salvation that's provided must be appropriated, and you appropriate the saving benefits of what Jesus did through faith alone. You must receive Jesus on faith alone. That's the currency that God deals in. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't be good enough to deserve it. You just stand there like the priests did in the Old Testament with empty hands and have your hands loaded with the emblems of priesthood. We have nothing commendable in ourselves with which we can bring to God that would make us somehow deserving of heaven. We can't. That is, that's why the Bible insists that it is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone that our salvation will be appropriated. That's it. That's the gospel, see? And the scourging and the blows that he endured, we are told that these are the prescribed punishments for guilty Judean kings. And Jesus presented himself to Israel as her long-awaited king. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. He is God's, he is God's ultimate, superior, matchless prophet, priest, and king, all three were anointed, and he is greater than all of them. He is the ultimate prophet because he is God himself. He is very God of very God, and he is the ultimate priest because because he is man. He can represent man perfectly, and he is the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. He is the Christ, the chosen of God. But the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, Guilty Judean kings would receive blows and stripes. And there's Jesus, the innocent, spotless, Davidic king, treated as though he were guilty, receiving our punishment that was due all of us. Look at verse 4, please, John. 
19.4. Pilate then went out again and said to, the, to them, that is to the crowds that were gathered, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the, and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. That's probably the greatest instruction Pilate ever gave to anyone. Look at him. Behold the man. And Jesus said, I must be lifted up like that serpent in the wilderness. Do you remember that story? In Numbers 21, venomous vipers had, had uh, been released out into God's people who were sinning and grumbling, murmuring, and complaining against God. And these these beasts were biting people and they were infecting them and people were dying. The poison was inside the people. They had to look somewhere else to be saved. Where was the antidote? God instructed Moses, make a bronze serpent, put it up on a pole, and anyone who has been bitten, anyone bitten, can look at that serpent in faith and they'll be cured. The poison will drain right out of them, it'll evaporate, it'll be gone, and they'll be saved alive. And Jesus said, I must be lifted up like that so that people can look at me and be saved. The serpent has bitten all of us. We're all infected with sin. But we can look to Jesus, hanging between heaven and earth, the crucified Christ, and we can be saved. And the poison's gone. And we're made new. That's what Jesus wants us to know. And who's this for? A select group of people? Not in the days of Moses. It said, everyone bitten could look. And be saved. And I insist that every last man, woman, and child on planet Earth can look to Jesus right now and be saved. No one's beyond the love of Christ. In fact, Isaiah 45, 22 insists, and this is God speaking now, look upon me and be saved all the ends of the earth. That's God's love for the world. God was in Christ reconciling what? The world to himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And into this drama comes what? Pilate's wife, of all people. Matthew 27, 19, she insisted, husband, have nothing to do with that just man over there. I've suffered many things because of him in a dream. Somehow she's in the know. There's something special about Jesus of Nazareth. Don't go near that guy. Don't touch that guy. Have nothing to do with what's happening here have nothing to do with that just man. (laughs) Friends, that's the impossible task. (laughs) Impossible. Have nothing to do with Jesus? We're all going to have something to do with Jesus. Neutrality is impossible. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. You either gather with me or you scatter abroad. Friends, the world and the godless spirit of the age will press down on every man... And you will be forced to make a choice on what you're going to do with Jesus. It's going to happen. The world will force you into it. And the early church, the anti-Nicene church, the church on the earth in the first 300 years of her history, they were captivated with a single question. And it was this. Are we going to die well for the one who died well for us? That's what they were thinking about. They weren't debating all kinds of stupid little things and bickering about dumb things like the color of the carpet or what kind of shingles we should put on our roof or this or that or some other peripheral nonsensical thing. They were interested in living for Jesus and dying well for him. And you come back to the Bible and you consult the record of God's dear son and you read about the passion of our Lord in the Gospels and that really gets your thinking straight and clear on what's really important around here doesn't it? Pilate will tell us three times, I find no fault in him. I find no fault in Jesus. And yet when he was threatened personally, the cost of standing with Jesus was far too great. This is the decision all of us are going to have to make. We're going to stand with Jesus and not be ashamed of him. We're going to bear his cross with him, endure the shame, that the world wants to heap on you for loving Jesus, following him, believing him? Or you cave under the pressure 
I don't know that man, like Peter there in the courtyard. We'll all be forced to make a decision. Pilate made his decision. Verse 16. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which in, is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Jesus bearing his cross is symbolic of the fact that we're all heavy laden with iniquity. And he has lifted it up off of all of us. That's Isaiah 1.4, a people heavy laden with iniquity. That was Israel. But Jesus invites us, Matthew 11.28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, Jesus says. Stop carrying your sins around with you. Stop carrying guilt with you and shame with you. And stop laboring to try to work off this sin debt. It ain't going to work. It's never going to work. Don't try it. Don't bother. If you try it, you've fallen from grace, Paul says. Don't bother. Just love Jesus and trust him. He'll take care of the problem. He can handle it. Jesus Christ is very great. If you don't remember anything else, remember that. Jesus said, I'll give you rest from all that. Did you notice, friends, that our great sin problem began at the dawn of human history, there in the garden? And at Golgotha, all the elements present at the dawn of this human drama, they were there too. We have a tree. We have sin. We have thorns. We have thieves. We have blood. Thinking about Jesus in this narrative here, takes our minds back to the dawn of the whole story, but it also makes our minds race forward to our own day. The same three attitudes that we see today attended that awful scene at Golgotha. We had antipathy as Jesus hung from the cross. People were hurling insults at him. Antipathy, hatred. These men are aligned against him as he hangs there dying and bleeding. And then you have apathy. You see that in the world too. The soldiers are gambling for his garments. They couldn't care less about Jesus. You see both attitudes in the world. People who hate him, people who could care less about him. But you also see sympathy. Christ's mother was there, and her lady friends were there, and the Apostle John was there too. And I want to say that took courage. You don't align yourself with one of Rome's condemned criminals. Or you might find yourself on a cross. And I don't know what all motivated John to go there. Maybe it was purely love for Jesus. Maybe there was some care and concern for Mary. Maybe John took courage and said, I'm not going to let that poor woman grieve alone. I'm going. Whatever happens, happens. That's courage. He was going to stand with Jesus. Look at verse 25 now, please. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. There's never been a man like Jesus Christ. Never. Death by crucifixion, unspeakably horrible, shameful, excruciating, agony, groping for breath, can't hardly speak, blacking out from pain, I'm sure. And with whatever strength he had humanly, he uses his breath to provide for others. John, take care of my mom. Can you believe that? There's never been a man like him. There's no hero on the earth like Jesus. Earlier in the Garden of Gethsemane, he stood between his enemies and his men. Stood right between them. You looking for me? Here I am. Let them go. Always caring about others. That's Jesus. That's our Lord. 
verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst, physical thirst, obviously, yes, but more than that, there was an estrangement from his father as he became sin, as he became a curse. And his father mysteriously turns his face away from his son and lays on him the iniquity of us all. That is a horrible thirst that Jesus endured so we never have to. The man Christ Jesus was alone in the universe accomplishing his redemptive work for the world. That's why the Bible says that he by himself purged our sins. He did it by himself. He was absolutely alone in the universe so you and I never have to be alone and we never have to endure this kind of thirst. Look at verse 30, please. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Shortest sermon in the world. Finished. Tetelestai, in the Greek, teleo. It's past, perfect, complete, done. There's nothing more to be done. Jesus Christ did what was necessary. Don't dare add anything to his finished work. It is finished, and you know it's finished because he was granted an honorable Jewish burial. His humiliation was over. And I like to think, friends, that when Jesus was dying for us all, he gave his clothes to the soldiers, and he gave his mother to John. He would give his body to Joseph of Arimathea, but his peace he gives to us. That's for us. He said, I give you my peace, not like the world gives. The world can't give peace like he does. The world gives peace that's what? Fragile, fickle, tentative. He gives us real peace with God, with each other, in our heart of hearts. And he gives us lasting joy. The world can't give that or take it away either. And he gives us real hope, hope that does not disappoint, Romans 5.5. 5. That's what we're celebrating here today, the center of our faith. I'm going to close with a prayer, and then I'll be done here. Almighty, blessed, and holy God, thank you, Lord, for these precious moments where we could gather together and we could contemplate so great a salvation. We could give Jesus the spotlight here today. We could remember him honor him, admire him, marvel at the greatness of Jesus Christ. The lion of the tribe of Judah who has prevailed and who alone now is worthy to take the scroll from the hand of his father, begin breaking the seals of judgment to reclaim a created order back to himself where it will reside under his headship and lordship And we look forward to the day when our living Christ will return to the earth and will subdue all things to himself and purge from his kingdom all things that offend. Oh God, thank you for entrusting this holy deposit to our care and ministry. We love you, Lord. We thank you for loving us first. Find us faithful in the days to come and all the days of our sojourn here on the earth. May it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for your patience also.